Uh, yeah. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about something that I built and shared uh, recently. It took me a while to build it, but at least I shared it recently. Uh, that is about getting data from passing airplanes and decoding it in JavaScript. So I'm not talking about pinging an API for something like a flight tracking website. I'm talking about literally having my little antenna here, pointing it at a plane and be like, give me all your data. So we're going to do this. Before I dive into it, I already was introduced, but my name is Charlie Gerard. I'm a senior developer at Stripe. Apart from that, I'm also a Google developer expert in web technologies. I'm the author of a book about TensorFlow.js. Uh, overall, I would define myself as a creative technologist just because I love to look at technology and instead of doing the practical things that I might do at work, I try to find weird ways to use them. And in general, I do that uh, in JavaScript. Uh, but I love tech, but I also love to get as far away as tech as possible. So I love to also uh, travel uh, solo, which is like my favorite thing to do. And here's like a glacier selfie from Iceland. Uh, but so before I start talking about, uh, about how to build uh, the thing that I built, I need to tell you that what I'm about to show you is uh, completely legal at least in the US. Uh, if you're doing this in other countries, they have different regulations. I'm just adding most of it under it because there are a completely illegal, illegal things that you could do with it. I'm gonna mention them at the end. I won't show you how to do it, but I think that if you want to experiment with that kind of things, it's important to know that you might be violating certain regulations. But again, what I'm, you know, the code I'm gonna show you and stuff like that is all, it's all legal. So I want to start by giving a shout out to Thomas Watson, who built something that was a huge inspiration for this talk. So in uh, 2017 in Paris at .js, he presented a talk uh, called Getting Data from the Sky, in which he talked about a Node.js module that he built that um, allowed him to connect to a USB device, like an antenna, that was getting data from passing airplanes, and then using WebSockets, he's sending that data back to the browser to display it, uh, display little airplanes on a map. So I learned by building things. So as soon as I watched this talk, I was like, oh, I didn't know you could do this in JavaScript. So I spent some time looking at his code, trying to rebuild it, but adding my little kind of touch to it. And that is actually removing Node.js, removing the server side, and doing everything in, uh, in the client side JavaScript, so on the Jamstack. So what do you actually need to do uh, or need to have uh, to start a project like this? So first of all, you need a little Software defined radio that's usually shortened as SDR, which is like this little device here. And uh, the one I have is called an uh, RTL SDR. And then I have a dipole antenna here as well. So you don't have to use the one that I have here. Uh, you can use any SDR as long as it can filter out the frequencies that you're looking for. So for airplanes, it's uh, 1090 megahertz. So there's other devices that you can buy as well. This one was pretty cheap, so I thought I would start with that one. And then to get the data in the browser, you need the Web USB API. So that's like a native API. You don't need uh, to add any, anything more. You can connect to a USB device and uh, start to do your decoding. And the decoding part of it is using just normal JavaScript. So you don't need any framework if you don't want to. I love to just write vanilla JS, so there's no React or anything. Uh, again, if you want to use a framework, you can. Uh, and you can write everything, all the demodulating and decoding code yourself uh, personally. I relied on uh, two modules, so rtlsdr.js by Sandy Mystery and Modest Demodulator by Thomas Watson to uh, do the first version of that uh, decoding part of the project. And then as these tools are open source, you can dive deeper in the code to try to do it all uh, yourself. All right, so let's go through the steps to actually uh, build something like this. So first of all, I want to quickly talk about radio waves. So you don't need to understand that first part of the talk to managed to work on the decoding part, but when I learned about it, I thought it was really cool, so I thought I'd share it with you. Uh, so here's like an antenna, and I'm gonna use mine here uh, as an example. So when you have a dipole antenna, it's like dipole, two poles, and like you have an electrically, um, positively charged part of the antenna, and you have a negatively charged part of the antenna. And when the antenna is powered, it creates an electromagnetic field around it. But the, when the current that you apply through the antenna, it makes electrons like jiggle jiggle through, like between the two parts of the antenna, so the plus and minus uh, parts of it kind of like uh, create this wave, like they disturb the electromagnetic field that's happening around the antenna, and as it happens over time, you have this movement, but over time, and that you get a radio wave. So if I just show you as like a little animation here, so you have here an electric current that's applied through the antenna, and it makes the electrons oscillate back and forth, I mean, up and down, usually you, you would uh, have the antenna like this, 
and that creates uh, the radio wave. So it disturbs the electromagnetic fields that surround, and that propagates uh, these waves at the speed of light through the air. So, like, that's cool, okay, but how do you actually encode data into, into this? So here, I just put it as like a little graph just to represent a wave. There's different ways that you can encode data in waves. You have different modulation techniques, so I'm not gonna go into this, but this pattern of waves, you could think that you would encode like, oh, um, so basically it happens as like an alteration of current. So current is always applied in the antenna for it to be powered, but then you have certain alterations that will represent a zero and one. So this alteration of current is going through the antenna, makes the electrons like jiggle jiggle, and that is emitted uh, through the air at a certain frequency. So this is for the transmitting part, but I'm a receiver, like I want to receive data from, airpla from airplanes. So how, is, uh, how does that work? So it's kind of the same thing, but like flip it and reverse it, you know? So um, you have the receiver, thank you. Okay, so <laughs> you have the receiver antenna that is tuned at, a, at the same frequency. So planes broadcast information at uh, 10, 90 megahertz. So your antenna has to be tuned to the same frequency. And if you think about normal radio waves when you want to listen to your favorite radio station, you kind of change the little uh, button that you have and you pick your favorite radio station. So if you're in Seattle and you have like KXP radio, I think it's 90.3 or something like that, you would choose that number and you can only receive um, or you decode data that is sent at that particular frequency so you only hear the station that you're interested in. You don't hear all of the possible stations uh, you know, to listen to your music. So the antenna is tuned to receive only the data at 1090 frequency and what happens is that it receives the, um, the radio waves and that creates the same movement of electrons in the receiver antenna. So if I have my receiver antenna here, it receives the radio waves from the transmitter, it makes the electrons move up and down in the same pattern as the one that was transmitted, and that creates an electrical current that has the same pattern as the signal that was sent, and you can recode, uh, re-encode the, uh, the original signal. And then you end up you know, transferring that or, re or decoding that into zeros and ones. Okay. But what does it have to do with planes? All right, so let's talk briefly about planes. So planes transfer data all the time. Uh, they have a lot of different sensors. You know, it has to know their speed, uh, latitude, longitude, and they have to transfer that all the time to ground control, to antennas on the ground that then relay the information to ground control. But a plane is not alone. There's like a lot of different planes that do the exact same thing all the time. But maybe most importantly, they also communicate with each other. Planes have to kind of know if there's other buddy planes around, so uh, they communicate um, to, to each other constantly. And the way that they do this is through what is called mode S signals and the ADSB system. So these are uh, communication protocols. So if we look at the structure of a mode S signal, this is what you would be looking for. There's a preamble that says like, hey, if I receive messages over the frequency 1090 and it has this exact preamble, then it would be a mode S signal, but what we're actually more interested in is the rest uh, of the messages that are either 56 or 112 bits. And uh, you know, remember that, 112 bits, because we're gonna look into what these bits look like later. And then, uh, so you have modest messages, but then you have some certain types of modest messages that are called uh, ADSB messages. And these are the structure of the 112 bits as well. And what do these mean? If you look, you know, this is just documentation that I uh, spent a lot of time researching. So you have a table that says like, okay, so we have the description of what bit, you know, from one to 112 mean. The first five bits are the downlink format, and I'll talk uh, shortly about this. But what we're more interested in decoding is going to be the message. So 56 bits of data that we're interested in between bit 33 and bit uh, 88. Okay, but now what do we actually get this data? So I talked theoretically about how radio waves are transmitted and received and the fact that planes send data to each other, but now we wanna do this with code. The point is to be able to get that in the browser. So first of all, with the WebUSB API, you have to call navigator.usb.requestdevice to be able to um, start filtering through the USB devices that are connected to your, to your computer. So here I just passed a variable filters, but usually you would have like a, the name of your device or anything that would uniquely identify that device, and that is different based on the specifications of the device that you bought. So you would need to do some uh, research about what the product name of your, of your device is, for example. Then once you get that device, you need to open communication with it, so you call the uh, open method. And here, uh, then you have to call what is called select configuration and claim interface, 
because USB devices are configured. Usually they only have one configuration, but they can have multiple ones. And uh, interface is the same. You're going to claim interface to be able to start communicating uh, within like, the device. So these numbers, like 1 and 0, it was more trial and error. I didn't really find uh, documentation about how many configurations and interface my specific device usually had. But uh, I basically changed the numbers until it worked. Uh, so these numbers worked. So one configuration and like uh, interface zero. And then what you would do, if you start doing it from scratch, you would usually call the method control transfer. That is going to, uh, is for the case of an RTL SDR, is going to start telling the device, okay, tune to that frequency and read these samples and things like that. But as I'm using RTL SDR.js, it kind of abstracted these methods. So what I used instead is a set sample rate of uh, 2 million samples and then set center frequency, which is our 1090 megahertz value. And here, then, you can read samples. Uh, the value, 128,000, I took it from the mode S demodulator package that Thomas Watson uh, wrote. Other values work as well, but this is like the part where I'm not exactly sure about which number is the best. But I you know, trusted Thomas Watson's code. And I was like, oh, he used 128,000, so I'll use the same. Uh, and that returns an array buffer. And to be able to read that data, you can transform that into an array of 8-bit integers. So what does that actually look like? So in the browser, it looks like this. So you continuously get tons of arrays of numbers. So like, cool, but what do I actually do with this? Like, I can't actually extract any human readable information from this. So the next part, and then, is decoding that data. So to, you, to decode the data, I actually use the mode S demodulator package by Thomas Watson. So it's, you know, usually you only need like two lines of code. I mean, you import it, and then you create a new demodulator. Then you call the process method on it. You pass it the data I showed you on the previous slide with its length and uh, a callback function. That, uh, so inside the demodulator, it's going to look at all the bits that you receive, try to figure out an ADSB message using the structure that I showed you earlier, and it's going to call you back you know, on the, the message on message function later. So without showing you code about what the demodulator does, I thought I would uh, kind of show you manually how you would do it just to give you uh, an idea, because the package is a bit too long to show you in like 20 minutes. So this is hopefully not too small, but if you can't see exactly the bits, it's fine. Uh, so here would be, once the data is passed into the demodulator, you get uh, arrays of 112 bits, which is exactly the amount uh, of data that we wanted. So you have arrays of length 112, and you have a lot of different bits, zeros and ones. So if we bring back the table that I showed you earlier, we're going to talk about downlink format. Because when you do research, you realize that, OK, civil aviation uses the downlink format 17. So it means that you, know, you can have like a military plane, but we don't want that. And uh, so it means that in the first five bits, if the downlink format is the number 17, then we know that we're going to have a civil airplane. But we're in bits. We're not in hexadecimal. So if we look at these bits here, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, they equal the hexadecimal value 17. So here, we know that the third array from the older ones that we're getting from the USB is actually an ADSB message. So that's the first start. Because uh, again, all of this data is like mode S, but not, not, not all mode S messages are ADSB messages. So uh, here we know that we have a message coming from an airplane that is a civil airplane, so all good, we can check. So now, what do we do with the rest of the array? Again, bringing back that table, that, uh, that structure of the message, so we know that from bit 33 to 88, we have the message. And that message then can contain a lot of different attributes like uh, latitude, longitude, speed, heading, and all that stuff. So to be able to differentiate between these, all of these types of messages that we could get, we have uh, the type code, which is shown just under message. And it shows that the first five bits of the message, so bit 33 to 37, is going to be the type code. And if I look at, yes, OK. So here we have a description of all the, all the different type codes that we could have. So when we're going to look at the rest of this array, if bit 33 to 38 has the hexadecimal, either like between 1 and 4, it's going to be a message about aircraft identification. So it could be your flight code or something like that. And then if it's a value between 5 and 8, it could be the surface position. What all of these mean, I don't really know. But uh, it doesn't matter right now. So. What we're going to see, OK, so from bit 33 to 37, we have the value 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then if you convert that in hexadecimal, it's 16. And if we look, oh, 16 from, it's between 9 and 18. So the rest of the message is going to contain information about the airborne position. And I'm not going to, so I'm going to stop here into like telling you how to manually do this. But I just wanted to show you that the 
demodulator is actually doing this. It's going through all of these arrays of bits and mapping it to the table that shows you the structure of any IDCP message, and then you can actually uh, extract data from that. So if you want to do it manually, it's kind of cool, but you know, the, the mod S demodulator does it uh, for you. But now that I've showed you uh, a little bit, I mean a little bit, a lot, about how uh, it works and how to do it yourself or do it with code, uh, I thought I would uh, show you a couple of videos that I took from my rooftop to show you what the actual uh, end, you know, end product is. All right, so first of all, you know, there's a plane, so yeah. All right, plane, and then I'm here, and then I see data being like scroll, like scrolling on my laptop. So it was really hard to, with the lighting, it was really hard to actually uh, be able to film this on my screen because my phone kept on losing focus. So you get some data, for example, we have like the speed, that's good, and we have the heading, and there's like some other things that are actually, I, I don't know where they are, but I can you know, figure that out later. And there's some values that are actually null, and uh, I haven't really figured out yet exactly why, but there's a few reasons. So the device that I'm using, the RTL SDR, by using a sample rate of like two million samples, it's really pushing it to its limits. So every time I plug it into my laptop and I run this, it, the device gets really hot really quickly. So there's other devices that you can buy that are more powerful and they probably might handle it more. Uh, another reason why some of these values are null could be that uh, the demodulator, maybe the code that I'm using is not uh, entirely you know, working. Or there's also the fact that you know, I'm in the city with other different buildings, so I'm not receiving I'm not like on the top of a mountain, you know, where I can receive whatever uh, all the time. So there might be some packets that I'm actually not receiving. But just to show you a second video, uh, at first I have like a waiting for airplane state because there's no airplane. So I'm kind of waiting there on my rooftop and then I'm starting to get data. And then what do I see in the far distance? An airplane. All right. So, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then just to like show you, I think there's a bit more nulls in these ones. So. Sometimes it was a little bit hard because uh, with the null values, I, I didn't have the time to figure out wh why that was happening. But the really exciting part is when sometimes I actually get a proper flight code, like, I don't know, like AS337 or something, and then I can actually compare it to a website that's a flight tracker, and I can really validate that I got the right airplane just passing over me, which is uh, really cool. So I'm uh, sorry, like, getting to the end of this talk, so I want to talk about the illegal part. So. Transmitting is illegal. And what I mean by that is that if you buy an RTL SDR, it's only a receiver, so you're good. But if you buy another type of device, like one that I'm gonna buy soon, it's called the HackRF1, and it is also a transmitter. And the reason why this is illegal is because you could create ghost uh, airplanes. So you could have, you know, I mean like, if you know the frequency at which you need to communicate and you know the format of the message, then you could pretend that you're an, uh, an airplane that actually doesn't exist. And you can understand why this would be a security issue in terms of, I mean, well, if you think about a pilot in a cockpit, they would be able to see that there's no airplane like, right in front of them, but it's still a distraction. Like while they're trying to figure out the problem with their system, they might not be looking at uh, something else that's happening around. So I don't have the real details about what you would risk if you were doing this, but I don't want to know. Uh, and yeah, so just don't do it. And also like, it's just not cool. And you might be thinking, well, surely there's some kind of protection, like there's not that much risk. But actually, not really. So there's a lot of research, security research done, and that's like one of my favorite papers that's called Ghost in the Air Traffic on Insecurity of ADSB Protocol and Practical Attacks on ADSB Devices, where people actually look at this, um, uh, at this protocol, and they don't really try to create ghost planes, but they kind of emulate what, it, what would happen. And there's a risk of like spoofing attacks where you could create some kind of ghost uh, airplane, but there's also jamming attacks where you would send so many signals over um, like in the right frequency that basically planes wouldn't be able to receive real messages from uh, airplanes nearby. So again, it's interesting to read. I just don't want to try it. So uh, again, I'm getting to the end of this talk, so I just wanted to share a slide of resources because I knew absolutely nothing about this before I even watched uh, Thomas Watson's talk, and then I kind of find my own resources, so I put them all on there. If, you, if the whole decoding part was interesting to you, uh, it, I mean, all of my knowledge comes from the Mode S decoding guide, which is like really cool. Like it's, somebody put the, like, their entire knowledge on there. It's like, you know, the way to share knowledge on the web. It's like a, a, yeah, a book. And uh, I really learned everything from this, so really, if you're interested, uh, here it is. But anyway, on this, uh, thank you so much, and thanks Jamsagcom for having me, and thanks everybody for coming back after your lunch break. <laughs>